Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the, inv for the invitation to be here, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, we, uh, we had a lot of fun back in the day, and uh, I never thought I'd be 50 years old and coming back uh, and uh, reflecting on all my uh, crazy days in my 20s here in Charleston as a, as the, as a young journalist uh, breaking it all in. Um, but it's, it's great to be back. I have so many great friends here, and I, and I still have a lot of family here. And uh, In fact, my brother just moved to Bridgeport. He, he works for the development work for Alderson Broadus. So my brother Jay is, uh, will be uh, down here tomorrow and might attend a, a happy hour somewhere along the way. Um, but uh, as Joe said, I, I, uh, I was business editor here from 1987 to 1994. And uh, the funny thing about the third house, um, there's a lot of funny things about the third house. And uh, we, we used to uh, lampoon, we were shamelessly horrible to everybody. And, and we were equal opportunity. So, uh, but the first lady was uh, Rachel, um, Rachel Warby at the time. And we used to just, we were so mean to her. Uh, and then one, one year we actually got her to, uh, to be a part of the gag. And I had the very unusual uh, situation. Uh, we were making fun of the governor and Rachel always having a lot of public displays of affection. And uh, so I had the unusual uh, uh, situation where the first lady was kissing me on stage in front of the governor who was sitting in the front row. But the governor got his revenge on me. Uh, my last day was in May of 1994. Uh, he, uh, I was lured away from my desk, and while I was away for a, a meeting that didn't exist, uh, they got Gaston to come in to uh, the office, and there he was sitting at my desk doing an imitation of me. Hey, I, I just think that was great, Phil. We want to talk about jobs and change and education. I just, I had to get back at you, because you made fun of me. So, but it was just great. And, and nobody ever said the word great as well as I did. I, I just, I, so I really appreciate this. Um, so when I left, when I left Charleston, I, uh, I've, had a, I've had a fantastic career, enjoying the, uh, a lot of different fantastic business stories. But I'll tell you what, we were talking about this last night. I, I covered some stories here that will never, will never be uh, equaled in, a, in my entire career. And uh, we had a lot. There's Gaston at my desk b pretending to be me. Um, so, uh, but I, when I was here, I, I mean, I'm from the Detroit area originally, and all my, both my sides of my family are from Detroit. So I always had an interest in the auto industry. And some of the big stories that I really enjoyed covering while I was here was the was, uh, NGK spark plug coming. That was one of my last great scoops here. Uh, we, ha we had the story lock, stock, and barrel before anybody else in town had it, and I was very proud of that, and I was really happy to hear about how well NGK has been doing since then over the last 20 years. They're one of the most stable private employers in the state, and, uh, and I want to congratulate the folks at NGK I, uh, who have just done a fantastic job with that company. Um, it's been a great success story, and I was glad I could be a little, a small part of the, of the success. I, I think the last story I covered was the groundbreaking, uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I also covered South Charleston stamping quite a bit, and, and at the time, in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, they were generating all kinds of new jobs and new revenue from the auto industry, um, and that was a great success, and I really enjoyed that. I was also early on uh, covering Senator Rockefeller's efforts to recruit Toyota, but unfortunately, my, you know, I, wasn't able to, I wasn't here for the actual final announcement, and now Buffalo, of, of course, is one of the most productive engine plants in the world, and uh, just a fantastic um, supplier to the Toyota manufacturing empire, um, and everybody associated with the Toyota plant should be very proud of what they've accomplished. Um, my company is Crane Communications. I'll just briefly go over this. We have paid circulation of 57,000. Uh, we are we are growing. We're one of the last media print media organizations that actually makes money printing something. Um, we have a great online presence as well. We have 59 million page views last year. We were up over 10 percent. Uh, we have a global staff of about 50 journalists, uh, and uh, we consider ourselves that we should own the automotive industry. We really uh, take a lot of pride in what we do, and we're able to hire world class journalists. 
Uh, just to get started, uh, today's news, I'll uh, give a couple headlines. Toyota outlined massive new savings in factory investment and vehicle development all today, along with fuel efficiency gains it aims to achieve through an aggressive company-wide restructuring being launched this year. Uh, a key part of this, and this is why it's of interest to West Virginia, is that there's going to be a new generation of Toyota engines that will be up to 25% more fuel efficient than those in today's Toyota vehicles, while still generating 15% more power, the company said. So um, a lot of, there'll be a lot of exciting changes coming to Buffalo as, as Toyota implements this. Uh, the UAW is starting to prepare for contract talks in Detroit. Uh, and the, the new president of the union, Dennis Williams, said yesterday that the, U, that the union wants to negotiate labor contracts with the Detroit Three later this year that are identical, going back to pattern bargaining. I really question whether that's going to happen because the, the three contracts now are so drastically different. I cannot imagine that the automakers will go for that, but we'll see. Um, also, uh, we have a gentleman here coming from the Department of Energy today, but uh, yesterday uh, the, DO, uh, the DOE uh, agreed to lend Alcoa $259 million to expand its automotive aluminum sheet production capacity in Tennessee, um, which ought to be a, a little bit annoying to people here in Ravenswood um, when you see the government hand, you know, giving them this kind of a deal, and I would guess the people at Century Aluminum would like to have something similar to help them stay competitive. Um, so that will no doubt, that headline will no doubt make the rounds in Ravenswood today. So West Virginia, we have a lot of opportunities here with the auto industry and the auto supply chain specifically. But uh, I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what I, I spoke to the uh, West Virginia Automobile Dealers Association early uh, last summer and I had a couple great ideas, uh, which I thought were pretty good ideas for the state to collaborate with the auto industry uh, in, you know, involving everything from marketing to product testing to uh, commercials and advertising. Um, but before I get to that, I'm gonna give you the lay of the land. Um, they sold six, about more than 16 million vehicles were sold in the United States last year, and that was up 6.3%. West Virginia made up a small portion of that. 85,500 vehicles were registered, new vehicles were registered in this state last year, and that's only up 1.7%. That's one of the weaker performances among the states. Um, the market leaders here are Ford, Chevy, and Toyota. Uh, they, and you know, that's not a surprise. Um, now, one thing I want to talk about is pickup trucks. Pickup trucks are the most important part of the U.S. auto industry, the, for the domestic three especially. Uh, GM, Ford, and Chrysler still control the vast majority of the, of the pickup truck market, which is the most profitable part of the business. Um, now, I want to talk about Texas just for a second. Texas is considered the king of all pickup truck states. They sell over 350,000 pickup trucks alone in Texas last year. 15% of the U.S. pickup truck market is in, is in the state of Texas. However, it's worth noting that in Texas, all those pickup truck sales only make up 22%. Look at West Virginia. West Virginia sells more pickup trucks as a percentage of total sales than Texas. West Virginia is the number one pickup truck market east of the Mississippi River. This creates huge marketing opportunities for the state and for the manufacturers who supply parts for those trucks and for a variety of other businesses that could benefit from, West, from, the, from pickup trucks being so popular here. Um, an example of what I'm talking about, Ford now makes a, an aluminum bodied pickup truck. The, F1, the new F-150 is one of the most exciting new products to come out of, the, out of Detroit in a long time. For the first time, you've got a mass market vehicle that is made up primarily of aluminum body panels. It makes, it's, they've saved about 600 pounds off the weight of the old F-150. So they're road testing. Ford is you know, touting how they road test the F-150 in America's toughest places. But West Virginia is not on this map. And that really bothered me when I saw it because I really think West Virginia should be on every map like this when it comes to tough, tough, testing tough durability trucks. Um, that dovetails with the idea that maybe West Virginia could have a formal location for a proving ground for one of the automakers where they're constantly testing products on, in, under tough conditions 
similar to what they do in, in, the, in the Detroit area with the Milford Proving Grounds, or in Chrysler's case, Chelsea. Uh, there's, I mean, these are very sophisticated operations that require a lot of engineering talent and, and, a, and a lot of jobs and a lot of development. It seems to me West Virginia could make a great pitch to become the home of, of a formal proving ground for one of the automakers. Maybe Toyota, that might make the most sense. Um, marketing and pickup trucks, great opportunities for West Virginia. You know, there's so many events here where they can tout the pickup truck, showing it you know, in great, you know, great locations throughout the state. Filming commercials is a big business. There are hundreds of millions of dollars, if you watch Mad Men, uh, you know, there's millions of dollars that go into filming automotive commercials. Why can't we do more of that here in West Virginia? Uh, you may have re remember this famous ad from about 10 years ago. GMC put an SUV over the New River Gorge Bridge. I thought that was a fantastic commercial for GM and for West Virginia. If that doesn't give you a, a great view, I don't know what does. So now we're gonna, let me uh, shift gears, no pun intended, uh, to talk about a little bit more about Toyota. Um, this is a refresher course. For those of you in the auto business, forgive me, I'm sure you've seen this before. But uh, these are the five points that Toyota makes uh, when they pitch, when, when they reach out to the auto supply chain. And you know, the first is their, their philosophy balances a long-term supplier relationship with an open door policy. They are very good about listening to pitches for new products and new technology. That's, they, they've got one of the best open door policies in the entire auto industry. I would urge any of you who want to get into, want to potentially do business with Toyota to explore this relationship. Potential suppliers, and this is, by the way, this is from Toyota's, this is actual Toyota's uh, pitch here. This is their words, not mine. Potential suppliers interested in doing business with Toyota should focus on the value proposition of its core competency capability. That means, can you make the part cheaper? Uh, we are looking for suppliers that bring new and innovative technology at a competitive price and a quality performance. So not only can you make the, can you make the part cheaper, can you make it lighter, and, and can you do it better than, than our current suppliers do. Potential suppliers can communicate their value proposition by contacting us through toyotasupplier.com. Uh, I've got that. This is, this, this is toyotasupplier.com. I would urge any of you in, interested in, the, in doing business with them to, to give this a good look. Uh, and Toyota has a, has a very established supply base in North America, so please be patient and persistent in pursuing future opportunities. Um, one thing to keep in mind, Toyota was basically shut down for a good chunk of 2011 after a tsunami hit their home core base in Japan. They didn't have any redundancies in their supply chain. They need to have redundancies, they need to have emergency backup plans for supplying parts. There's no reason why a West Virginia supplier can't be a part of that equation, because they do need that redundancy in their system. There's opportunities there for people. Uh, here's the basic toolkit that most of you should be familiar with that, that attracts the auto industry to, to West Virginia and to other states. It's the skilled workforce, the available workforce, livable communities for that workforce that will retain talent and keep you know, good quality employees in place for the long term. I, I know a lot of people in the supply chain who can't keep their talent. They, they constantly are losing it. They have trouble running their plants particularly in rural areas because there's so much turnover and the inability to attract and, and retain talent. Uh, state and local government support. This is a part of the game. Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, all the other states that West Virginia competes with, it, they all, it, it's a very competitive landscape. But I think West Virginia has plenty of other attributes to offer to make them competitive. Available land. Obviously, West Virginia's got that. Strong infrastructure, rail, highway, you know, you need to get the parts to the, to the OEM. Um, and then we talk about the proximity issues. I-64 gets you to Toyota in Georgetown in a matter of two or three hours. US-33 or 35 can get you to Marysville, Ohio, where Honda has several plants in a matter of three hours. Uh, and up north, you can get to Lordstown in a matter of a couple hours. So there's, you know, there's enormous opportunities within a very close distance. Um, this is the map from uh, the West Virginia Department of Commerce. That outer circle basically encompasses almost every auto plant in North America, including Canada uh, and the South. 
So West Virginia, a, a, a supplier in West Virginia, and I'm sure NGK could tell you this, they can supply everybody because they're within a day's drive of everybody. And that's something that few other states can offer. Uh, another thing to, be, to think about, the U.S. auto industry now will be required to achieve a, a fleet, a, a corporate average fuel economy of 50 miles per gallon in 10 years. Does that make a lot of, does that, what kind of mileage do you get on your cars right now? 25, 30 maybe, 40 if you're lucky. The average fuel economy for the fleet has to be 50, over 50 in 10 years. That's three product cycles. It takes three or four years to re-engineer a, a typical car. We're only three product cycles from the industry having to reach the, that goal under, under the federal CAFE requirements. This is another huge opportunity for companies to step in and get new business and build their plants in West Virginia or elsewhere. Uh, light weighting is the term a lot of us are, are looking at. We hear the term light weighting almost every day at Automotive News. It's crucial. Aluminum can play a major role in that. Ravenswood Aluminum, well, Century Aluminum, has an opportunity there to capture some of that business if the government doesn't subsidize their competitors. So, sorry. <laughs> Editorial comment. <laughs> Another opportunity out there, and, and I had the, the I actually had a chance to discuss this with the governor and Keith Burdett last night at the at the reception. But there's a global crisis right now in the airbag business. There's a huge shortage of airbag inflators, and there's only four companies that make them globally. Uh, there's a company out of Japan called Takata, that's a, a huge Honda supplier, and and their airbags have a problem when they go off they tend to spread shrapnel throughout the cabin. How many of you drive Hondas? If you drive a Honda and you haven't taken it in for recall work, do it fast because the airbags are potentially lethal and there's been six fatalities already recorded like this and basically there's 10 automakers, primarily Honda, and Honda being the leading one, they have to recall every airbag or they face this safety dilemma. Um, my thoughts are that, and this is my own opinion, West Virginia should be making pitches to land airbag manufacturing plants in, in, in this state. Um, it, and I know the governor will be talking about, you know, probably calling on a couple companies in Japan when he goes there. Um, there's no reason why, and, and the advantage for West Virginia is that you can't build airbag plants in a, in a, in a populated area. These are, these are the type of plants that need to be in isolated locations and because they potentially could blow up because they make explosives. Uh, Takata, this picture on, on the right, had a plant blow up on them in, um, in Mexico several years ago. Um, now obviously we don't want to have that happen, but uh, the fact is they, you know, for risk management, they need to build these plants in rural places. Why not West Virginia? Um, Joe asked me to also bring up a little bit on, on compressed natural gas vehicles. Um, I don't know, did you handle Eastern Americans stations years ago? There, there were filling stations here in the early 90s that, that a company called Eastern American Energy had put up. So this is not a, a new development. However, fleets have embraced CNG vehicles in a, in a lot of locations and it creates great opportunities for West Virginia oil and natural gas uh, for, uh, suppliers. So I don't, I don't see a, a broader acceptance of CNG vehicles outside of fleet. But you never know, and certainly with fleets, there's plenty of business there for everybody. So, um, GM, this is a this is a or this is a Ford that had a a long distance CNG powered pickup truck. It's an innovative technology. Unfortunately, a lot of the automakers are are gravitating more towards electric vehicles and hydrogen powered cell, uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, seem to be the the uh, alternative of choice for the broader vehicle lines. Um, quick mention here, you, uh, in five years you should be able to go to an auto dealer near you and buy a car that drives itself. You can program in the address that you want to go to, press a button, and the car will take you there. It's an amazing development and it is moving extremely fast. It's now, you know, there's beta, there's testing going on already in, in uh, Delphi Automotive, a big, a, a big auto supplier, is now uh, sending a car across the country without a driver. I mean, there's somebody 
in the car, making sure it doesn't crash. But, um, but they are now testing cars at length to travel you know, without a driver. Um, and that's been the big event at a lot of auto shows, uh, autonomous cars. Um, uh, Nissan CEO Carlos Ghosn has put a 2020 goal on Nissan selling autonomous cars. Mercedes is doing it, GM is doing it, Tesla, which is one of the most innovative companies in the auto industry, is doing it. I mean, and I'm not just saying they're experimenting with it, they're doing it. They, but they need, regulate, they need to pass regulatory scrutiny, and that has not been hashed out yet in Washington. I think West Virginia has opportunities to be a part of this. If you want a road test, an autonomous car, I'd certain, sure as heck would want to do it in West Virginia to see if it can handle the narrow roads and, and the road conditions here. Again, a chance for West Virginia to be out front testing innovative, important new vehicles. So what's next? There's just a lot, there's a lot out there in the auto industry. Um, one of my favorite stories is I used to, I used to know the, the, the head of global purchasing for General Motors quite well. He had $87 billion to play with every year. And he, with one signature, he could create a thousand jobs. Or with one signature, he could put a thousand people out of work. He was an interesting character. Um, but I was, you know, I was telling the governor this last night. You need to have a relate, figure out who's running the purchasing departments at, at all the automakers, because these people have enormous power to create jobs in in new places and to award business to new companies. These are where you. This is where you want to be. Is in front of the purchasing chiefs. If they get to know you, they see what you're up to. They might want to do business with you. So with that, I'll take a couple questions. Or if, any anyone uh, have any questions? Oh. Clearly, that's a part of the equation all the time. I mean, I, don't, I can't remember the exact percentage of what a typical vehicle carries, but you know, I have an entire uh, affiliate named Plastics News. That's all they cover. Um, that's a given. Plastic parts and composites are, are a growing part of, of the lightweighting solution. Um, I brought up aluminum because it's such, to see a, a vehicle as popular as the F-150 go to aluminum is, is really a game changer. But the plastics industry, and, and there's a lot of folks here in West Virginia that, that are involved in this, both from a chemical standpoint and a manufacturing standpoint, there's enormous opportunities there for new business to you know, replace traditional steel parts with plastics and composites. And that's something Dow and DuPont and everybody else is, is a part of, and they've got great ideas and solutions, and they have the resources and the, and the relationships to make it all happen. So we hope that the people in Midland will continue to remember West Virginia when they're bidding on new contracts with the big three and with the, and with the transplants. But that's a great point, and I probably should have brought it up anyway. It's a classic chicken and the egg thing. Um, I talked to one of the top people at Honda about this in preparation for the speech. They simply have not seen enough consumers embrace it. There's not a, there hasn't been a broad enough acceptance by the, you know, and they did produce commercially viable CNG vehicles, but finding enough filling stations has always been the problem. And I know West Virginia is getting some new filling stations. It's, it's a, it, and it is a classic chicken and the egg. Unfortunately, Toyota is a big leader in, in alternative energy thought in, in the industry, and they have publicly embraced hydrogen as their, as their alternative uh, of choice. And they're building hydrogen stations in California, um, and that seems to be the trendsetter. Um, I think there is a CNG still has a, has a great place for, us, for established fleets. But I'm not hearing any of the automakers really embracing it for broader applications. Honda, Honda made CNG powered um, vehicles uh, uh, in Marysville for several years and they simply just didn't have enough consumer acceptance. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Uh, one of the most entertaining battles that we like to cover and write about because we like conflict in the media when people are mad at each other um, is, is, the, is the ongoing rivalry between steel and aluminum. Every year they bend our ears like they bend metal um, about which one, which one is going to be better off. Um, and, and the innovation seen both in the steel and the aluminum sides driven by this competition it can do nothing but good for the auto industry and for and for a lot of jobs and economic development. Um, I'm, the, I'm certainly not going to poo-poo the steel industry because they've got the history, they've got the durability, they've got the, the expertise and the know-how to continue to be competitive. Um, it'll be very interesting. There's a couple vehicle programs right now that are being considered for steel versus aluminum. Uh, my hometown of Toledo, which is home to the Jeep, and the Jeep Wrangler specifically, is, is debating right now whether to take the next generation Wrangler to aluminum versus steel. And I'm not so sure they've made a decision yet, but it'll, if they go to aluminum, they have to build a new plant because they can't build it on the steel line where they produce the current body. So um, the, the, another factor in here is the, uh, the Toyota Camry may be going to substantially a lot of aluminum as well. And that's made in Georgetown could be opportunities again for West Virginia aluminum, but steel's always going to be there. Steel is just as competitive. So I'd love to be a bug on the wall of some of these meetings between uh, the, o the OEMs and the steel and aluminum people. There's a lot of intrigue and a lot of competition going on there. Yeah, the Germans will force feed us on diesel eventually. They're going to bring it here. I mean, maybe not in, broad, in a broad way, but pickup trucks, diesel pickup trucks, they sell. I mean, they can sell those. But uh, you know, you, you, they, diesel still has the dirty image with the American consumer that the European consumer simply doesn't have. Americans you still equate diesel with, you know, you know, dirty, smelly pickup truck or, uh, you know, Mack trucks. So there needs to be a, if they really want to sell diesels here, they've got to do a better job marketing it to the, to the broader audience. And uh, there's, there's always fits and starts with this every now and then, particularly Volkswagen really wants to do diesels here. But, you know, it's still an evolving concept for the American driver for for sedans, for truck, you know, for pickup truck drivers, diesel is not a problem. Anybody else? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here.